right, I think the recording has started. So I'm gonna go ahead and start talking to you like it has. We're gonna give this a shot and see how well it works for me to record some lectures, or at least record this lecture. Tonight, we're gonna to start by talking about acceleration, which is the next topic we have to discuss in physics. Acceleration, put simply, is a change in velocity. There are three ways that velocity can change. Velocity can change when we speed up. Velocity can change when we slow down. Or because velocity is a vector, a vector has what two things? Magnitude and direction. Because velocity is a vector, velocity changes when we turn. We'll talk about circular motion a little bit later in the course. It's a special case of changing velocity. And even if your motion is staying at a constant speed, if you're going in a circle, it turns out you are accelerating. So more fun stuff to learn with um, this turning idea of changing velocity later, but that's not for right now. So speeding up is to go faster, slowing down is to go slower. But here's the thing we wanna be really careful with. There is not a sign convention that matches speeding up and slowing down. So it is not true that when we speed up, our acceleration is positive, and when we slow down, our acceleration is negative. To understand why, we wanna go back and remember what our sign conventions were to begin with. So for position, what does it mean to have a positive position? All it means is that on the number line we're moving along, we have picked a zero for an origin, we have picked a positive side, we have picked a negative side, and if our position is positive, then we are on the positive side of this line. All positions on this side of the line continuing on forever are positive. All positions on the other side of the line are gonna be negative. So all, all the sign of position tells us is which side of zero we're on. For velocity, a positive velocity moves in the positive direction. So if we have a position that starts out negative and is moving towards the positive, that would be a positive velocity. If we have a position starting with zero and going towards the positive direction, that's a positive velocity. Or if we start with a positive position that becomes more positive, any of those is considered to be a positive velocity. And then the opposite is gonna be a negative velocity. The really important thing to notice here is that I can have a positive velocity when I have a negative position, or I can have a positive velocity when I have a positive position, and I can have a negative velocity no matter whether my position is positive or negative. Put another way, I can move forward anywhere along this number line, and I can move backwards anywhere along this number line. The positive and negative velocities don't depend on where I am at all. Now we can finally come to acceleration. A positive acceleration means that my velocity is becoming more positive. A positive acceleration means that my velocity is becoming more positive. So let's say my velocity starts out at negative 20 meters per second. If my velocity is negative 20 meters per second, I'm moving backwards. If a second later, my velocity is negative 10 meters per second, I'm still moving backwards, but I'm moving slower. If a second later, my velocity is zero meters per second. And then a second later, my velocity becomes 10 meters per second. Then with each passing increment of time, my velocity is becoming more and more positive. This is all a positive acceleration. Even though I start out going backwards, I pause briefly, and then I start going forwards. When my acceleration and my velocity have opposite signs, I am slowing down. So when I had a negative velocity and a positive acceleration, 
I was slowing down. When my velocity became positive and my acceleration was still positive, then I was speeding up because the next time here is gonna be 20. At, at the next time here, our velocity will be 20 meters per second. You may wanna rewind and listen to that again. Um, this is one of the most confusing things about acceleration and about the part of kinematics that we're learning right now. If I have a negative acceleration, my velocity is becoming more and more negative. So let's imagine that my velocity starts 20 meters per second. A second later, my velocity is 10 meters per second. A second later, my velocity is at zero meters per second. My velocity is becoming more and more negative by becoming less and less positive. My velocity has a positive sign, I'm moving forward, but my acceleration has a negative sign, so I'm slowing down in this first part of my motion. But if the same type of motion continues, then a second later, my velocity will be negative 10 meters per second, and a second after that, negative 20 meters per second. My velocity is still becoming more negative with each passing second, and so my acceleration is still negative. When my velocity is positive and my acceleration is positive, I speed up. When my velocity is negative and my acceleration is negative, I'm speeding up. But when my velocity and my acceleration have opposite signs, I'm slowing down. If it doesn't quite make sense yet, it probably shouldn't. Um, it's gonna take a little practice before this, before this really clicks for us. Let's think about how we recognize that an acceleration is happening on a position versus time graph. On a position versus time graph, we know acceleration is taking place when our line is curved. This curved line shows a positive velocity. We know it's a positive velocity because the slope is positive, the line is moving up. It's also a positive acceleration because the object starts out moving at a very slow speed, the slope is close to zero, and the slope, become, slope becomes steeper and steeper as we go. So this black line has a positive velocity and a positive acceleration, and the object is speeding up. Let's try another curve. My slope is still positive for the red line. My line is still moving up, so my velocity is positive. But as time passes, that curve becomes closer and closer to horizontal. My velocity is becoming less positive, which means more negative, which means I have a negative acceleration. The, thing that's, the other thing that I want us to remember here, though, is that on a position versus time graph, when we see a curved line, a curved line of, on a position versus time graph tells us that we have an acceleration taking place. On a velocity versus time graph, we know an acceleration is taking place when our velocity doesn't stay the same, when our velocity has a non-horizontal line. And that line can be sloped upward or downward. It could be in the positive area or the negative area. The top line that I drew here, this is a positive velocity. We're moving forward and it's a positive acceleration because the velocity is becoming more positive. The line on the bottom here is a negative velocity. It's a negative velocity because it's below the axis but it's still a positive acceleration because the slope of that velocity versus time graph is acceleration. This is an important thing to say, and so I'll say it again. The slope of a velocity versus time graph equals the acceleration. And this is gonna let us write a definition for acceleration. Acceleration is a vector, it's equal to the change in velocity over time. If we think back to how we defined the slope of the line for the position versus time graph and related that to the velocity, we can see that we've done sort of the same thing here. I'm gonna do the same rearrangement that I did with the velocity definition 
and come up with an equation that says my final velocity is equal to my initial velocity plus my acceleration times time. This equation should make pretty good intuitive sense. How fast I'm going at the end will equal how fast I was going in the beginning plus how much my velocity changes. My velocity changes based on what my acceleration is and how long I undergo that acceleration. This equation also describes these line graphs over here on my velocity versus time graph where the initial velocity is my intercept and the acceleration is the slope. This is the second of my big five kinematics equations. The third one relates these two velocities, v initial and v final, to the v average that was in the first equation. v average, as long as our acceleration is constant, okay, hang on just a second. Maggie the cat is in the way. Those of you who did not have me last year don't know about Maggie the cat, but she is, she's kind of a pain. I love her, I do, I love her a lot, but she really wants to lay down on the little pad here that I'm trying to write on, which is not helping my process. Sorry, Maggie. She'll be back in a second, don't worry. As long as our acceleration is constant, then our final velocity is just gonna equal our initial velocity. Nope, hang on. I'm distracted by Maggie, I'm blaming her for this. Let's try this one more time. My average velocity is equal to my initial velocity plus my final velocity divided by two. This one's the third of the big five kinematics equations. The fourth kinematics equation comes from subbing these two equations into the first equation, the one that we learned in class last week. And after I do that, I arrive at what we usually call the long equation. Final position is equal to initial position plus initial velocity times time plus one half acceleration times time squared. You have almost certainly seen this equation before in the physical science class or something like that. This is a really handy equation for problem solving. I'll be honest, it's the one I use the most. But another really useful equation that sometimes gets forgotten is the fifth equation, which is the VF squared equation. VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2A delta X. One thing that you might notice about this equation that is really convenient is that it doesn't include time. And since it doesn't include time, it can make our problem solving simpler sometimes. All right, I will give you these five kinematics equations every time you have a quiz in this class, no matter what the quiz is over, because we're gonna keep using these five kinematics equations both for the whole fall semester and then still in the spring semester. These are among the most useful equations in physics. One thing that I want to say here, and that's really important, is that all four of these equations assume constant acceleration. You'll notice that I did not say that it was the average acceleration that was equal to change in velocity over time, which was an important thing that I said when we were defining velocity. Technically, that is true. But these four equations assume that we have constant acceleration. You can solve problems where acceleration isn't constant, but to do so usually requires calculus. So it's beyond the scope of this course. So we're gonna stick with the big five kinematics equations and we're gonna stick with solving problems where the acceleration is constant. Speaking of problems, let's solve one. A car is initially moving at 20 meters per second. It has an acceleration of negative four meters per second squared for three seconds. 
I don't think I defined the unit for acceleration, but it's velocity divided by time. So meters per second squared should make sense. We, will, we can define acceleration in any unit of length per time per time. So when you hear in a commercial that a car can go from zero to 60 in 4.5 seconds, that's defining an acceleration in miles per hour per second, which is certainly a way that we could define acceleration. In physics, though, we're usually going to use meters per second squared. So a car is initially moving at 20 meters per second. It has an acceleration of negative four meters per second squared for three seconds. My first question is going to be, what is its new velocity? The problem solving strategy I want to use for this problem is to pull out the numbers. So to use this strategy, I look for numbers in the problem. I'm going to pull these numbers out one at a time and I'm going to attach them to variables. The first number I come to is 20. I can't just take the number, I've got to take the unit too, because the unit is going to contain clues about what variable I should attach to this number. Meters per second is how we measure velocity. We have several kinds of velocity in our physics equations. We're going to look for context clues to figure out which kind of velocity this is. Our three possibilities are initial, final, and average. And I see the word initial in the problem right before this. So I'm going to label this as VI. Next number I come to is that negative 4 negative four meters per second squared. Either the unit or the word acceleration in the problem will tell me that this should be an acceleration. Now, hopefully you notice that I carry that negative sign with me. We discussed earlier how that's going to be important. The last number I come to is three. Its unit is seconds. And so this is going to be a measure of time. All right, I have all of the numbers that are written in the problem. A little bit later, we'll talk about the fact that sometimes numbers get hidden in problems. Um, sometimes there are words in problems that turn into numbers, things like comes to a stop or starts at rest. And we'll talk about how those things turn into numbers a little bit later. For right now, though, we're going to work with what we've got. The last thing we want to do is figure out what variable are we looking for. So what is the problem asking us for? The problem is asking us for a velocity, and it says it's asking us for a new velocity. Well, we're going to translate new velocity to mean final velocity. So we're looking to find a final velocity. We were given an initial velocity, an acceleration, and a time. So what we're going to do now, either literally or sort of mentally, is we're going to go to our big five kinematics equations. We're going to go to our equations and look for an equation that has these four variables in it. Turns out this is a great problem to solve because not only do we have an equation, it has exactly the right variables and it's already solved for the one that we need. Vf equals vi plus at. So the final velocity of my object is going to equal my initial velocity, which is 20 meters per second, plus my acceleration is negative 4 meters per second squared, times my time is 3 seconds. So 20 meters per second minus 12 meters per second gives me a final answer of 8 meters per second. I want to do a little bit of reality checking here. If my velocity and my acceleration have opposite signs, then I should be slowing down, and this speed is slower than the initial speed was. So that makes sense. So this seems like a reasonable answer. Question A was pretty easy. Now let's try question B. I'm going to go ahead and erase this work so that we have some space to work without having to rewrite the problem. So my new velocity was 8 meters per second. So Question B might ask, how far does it move in this time? So now we have an initial velocity, 
we have an acceleration, we have a time, we have a final velocity, and we're looking for how far does it move. So how far does it move could be a couple of different things. We could be looking for displacement, or we could be looking for a final position, in which case we're gonna assume that our initial position is equal to zero. Those are gonna be functionally the same. If xi is zero, then xf and delta x are the same. So we're supposed to find how far it moves in this time. <clears throat> I want you to pause the video, take a few seconds, and try to solve the problem. Try to figure out a way to figure out how far it moves in the time. Did you pause? Did you really try it? If not, you should. The way you learn physics is to actually try to solve the problems, not just wait for me to show you how to do it. All right, hopefully you've got it now. My guess is that you used one of three strategies to solve this problem. The strategy that I would probably use is the long equation. So let's call this strategy one. In strategy one, I say, okay, I need XF, and XF is equal to XI plus VIT plus one half AT squared. XF is what I'm supposed to find. XI we said was zero. VI is given in the problem, 20 meters per second. My time is three seconds. One half times, negative four meters per second squared times three seconds squared. So XF is gonna be equal to zero, we can ignore. But this is kind of nice. 20 meters times three seconds gives us 60 meters. That's the value of this term of the long equation. But what this also tells us is how far the car would have moved if it didn't have an acceleration. If it had stayed at a constant velocity, the car would have moved 60 meters. It's not gonna move that far because its acceleration is negative and it's slowing down. But this is the distance that it would have moved if it weren't for the acceleration. If the acceleration were positive, the final position would be even farther away. Since the acceleration is negative, we're not going to go this far. So 3 squared is 9 times negative 2 is negative 18 meters. 60 minus 18 gives us 42 meters. I'm pretty sure yeah, that math seems to work. Okay, um, this answer seems to make reasonably good sense. So let's go on and talk about another method that we could have used. This method is the most efficient method. It's one equation and it gives us the answer. But it's not physically as intuitive for most students. Option two, option two says, we're supposed to find final position. Final position can be found if we know the initial position and the average velocity. So that's an equation that we could use to find final position. We know the initial position, we can set it to be zero, and we know the time, so all we would need to use this equation would be V average. But we know an equation for V average, and the V average equation is a pretty simple equation. V average is just V initial, plus V final over two. So my average velocity in this time is gonna be 20 meters per second plus eight meters per second divided by two. 20 plus eight is 28 divided by two gives me 14 meters per second for my average velocity. So then to find my final position, I'll just take zero, which is my initial position, plus 14 meters per second times three seconds. And what do we come up with? We come up with 42 meters, which is the answer to, well, it's the answer to life, the universe, and everything, and also this physics problem. All right, so that's option two. I'm going to get rid of this work here. I like option two, even though it's not the one I think of 
because each of these equations, these two equations are so simple and they're so easy to sort of conceptually understand, which isn't always the case for the long equation. All right, option three, the third way to solve this problem is to use the VF squared equation. VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2A delta X. Now, the acceleration, which is the number that we need, or the distance, which is the number that we need, is kind of buried here in the problem, but that's okay, we can find it. So our final velocity was eight, so eight meters per second, we'll have to square that, is equal to the initial squared, which is 20 meters per second squared, plus two times negative four, meters per second squared times, I can get my delta x in there, you betcha. All right, eight squared is 64, and this unit is actually meters squared per seconds squared. 20 squared is 400, again, meters squared per second squared, which is equal, or sorry, not equal to, but maybe, Hang on, let me try a thing just real quick. No, that'd be too easy. Four hundred meters squared per second squared minus eight times delta x. So we're gonna to have to put the minus eight over here to make it positive. So here we have eight delta X on this side, and then we're gonna have 400 minus 64, which is gonna give us 336. And I would need a calculator for this, I'm not gonna lie. But you know what? Oh, actually, no, I can't. I can do this division in my head. Eight goes into 33 four times with a remainder of one which becomes a 10, eight goes into 16, two times. Ha, ah, check it out. I'm kind of proud of myself. All right, so which of these methods is the best one? The method that's the best one is the one that you thought of or the one that made the most sense to you. And that won't be the same for everybody. And that's kind of the fun part about these kinds of kinematics problems. It turns out there are lots of different ways to solve the problems and there's not necessarily a best way. As long as you're using the equations, as long as you are following sort of the, the steps that we've outlined, um, and as long as you get the right answer, that's all we're looking for. All right, um, I hope you feel like you've got a bit more of an understanding of velocity and acceleration. I hope you are ready to solve some problems. We'll do some of this in class this week, and you've got some practice problems before your quiz, which is, um, when is your quiz? Oh, your quiz is Wednesday and Thursday. So good thing to get started on this week. All right, have a good one.